Hi, this is Bartosz Miluski, and this is the first installment in the series of tutorials about C++11 and concurrency. What prompted this uh, series is um, the new C++11 standard, which has just been ratified, and it comes with threading support, a portable support for threads. So that it has thread, mutex, condition variable, futures, package tasks, and stuff like this. It also comes with a memory model, which essentially describes the visibility of writes between threads. And uh, there is a library, atomic library, based on, on this memory model, uh, which contains atomic variables and fences. The standard also comes with a lot of other interesting things like lambdas, move semantics, which I will be using in this tutorial. And I will be explaining this, these, these things as well. This is a fully hands-on tutorial, so I will often be writing code, editing it, compiling, running, and sometimes even debugging. Let me say a few words about compilers. This is a new C++ standard, so the support for it is very patchy. Uh, there is one compiler on Linux, um, GCC 4.7, which has um, the best support. Uh, I'll be mostly using Visual Studio 2010. doesn't support threads, standard threads, but there is a library I'll be using by Anthony Williams, Just Thread. It's the most complete implementation of the standard that I know of. Um, there are other libraries. Uh, these two libraries are task-based, which is a very interesting approach to concurrency, which I'll be discussing too. If you're into books, Anthony Williams wrote a very nice book about the new C++ standard as far as concurrency is concerned. There is this book, Parallel Programming with Microsoft C++, which introduces a lot of concepts about parallel programming that are generally applicable. If you are into theory, then The Art of Multiprocessor Programming is a very good book. Debugging is um, very difficult. Our company, Corensic, makes uh, Jinx, which is bug accelerator but if you can't afford it uh, there are other free uh, offerings on the market this is hello thread we'll start with the simplest possible program traditionally and i'll show it how it works on linux using gcc 4.7 and then on visual studio using the just thread library Here we are on Linux. I have GCC version 4.7 installed on this machine. And let's start writing our program. I'll call it thread.cpp using the trusty old VI. So we want to write a program that will create a thread. And in this thread, it will print hello thread. In order to print something, of course, we have to include include IO stream. IO stream. Okay, and since we want to create a thread, include thread, obviously. Let me go to main immediately. Int main. And the first thing we want to do is create a, a thread. And that means just uh, declaring a thread object, std thread, and constructing it. I'll call it th. And what you pass to the constructor of a thread is a function. So this thread will execute the function and then exit. Uh, I don't have a function yet, but I'll write it later. Let's call it thread function. Okay, so the thread is now created. It will be nice to actually print something from main so that we know 
that we have two threads. One is the main thread, and the other is the, our worker thread. So let's write hello world exclamation new line. Okay, now if I finished here and closed the brace, um, what would happen is that the thread would be created indeed, um, then main would print hello world, and then it would exit immediately. That's the end of main. And it's very unlikely that the thread would actually start, because it doesn't have the time to do that. Right, so we have to wait for the thread to finish. We have to wait until the, th the thread, the worker thread, has done its printing. And this is done by calling the threads method join. Okay, and just to satisfy the compiler, I'll say return zero because we are successful. Okay, what's missing is, is the thread function. So let me write the thread function. Void thread function. It could also take arguments, but in this case we won't pass any arguments. Maybe in the next installment. stdc out. And here's our famous printout. Hello from thread oh, new line and that's it that's the whole program we have included thread because we're creating threads we have a thread function that does very little and we have main in which we create a thread passing it a thread function we print something and then we wait for this thread to finish while we are waiting we are idle, nothing is happening in the program, and actually the operating system can take the processor away from us and do something else. So let me save this. I have a make file here, so I will just compile it very quickly. Okay, no problems. And let's run it. And indeed, main printed hello world and thread printed hello from thread so that worked uh, the simple example that i've shown you the hello thread is an illustration of a more general uh, idea of fork join parallelism this is a very uh, popular pattern that's used in concurrent programming and this, this, this is an illustration that shows it. Uh, uh, you, you start with a single thread. Time here goes from top to bottom. You hit a fork, at which time you the execution splits into two branches. One is the continuation of main, in which you, we print high from main, and then call join. Uh, and the other branch is is the worker thread that prints high from thread and finishes, and then they both join and continue as a single thread. So this is an idealistic picture. In reality, things are not that symmetric. Here's a more uh, realistic picture. Again, we start with single thread, uh, and we call uh, the constructor of thread. So this is our fork point. And while the worker thread is starting, which takes usually a long time, because there is a big thread creation overhead in the operating system. Okay, There are ways of uh, dealing with this, like thread pools and so on, uh, which I'll talk about at some other point. So while this thread is cre being created, uh, main continues and prints high from main and calls thread join and this call blocks and for the for this duration uh, the thread is, is blocked finally the worker thread gets a chance to run 
and it prints high from thread and finishes and at that point the other the main thread is unblocked uh, returns from the call to join and continues single thread so you don't really see a lot of parallelism in this particular program and you usually see high from main followed by high from thread almost every single time Here we are in Visual Studio. This is Visual Studio with the library Just Thread that implements threading support. And as you can see, I just rewrote the same program, high from thread, high from main. Uh, what I want to show here is um, the debugging. Okay, the traditional de debugging um, in Visual Studio. I'm going to set a breakpoint inside thread function and I'll set another breakpoint at the end of the program and we will stop in the thread function and, and uh, I'll show you uh, the thread display. So let's start. Okay, here we are in thread function. Now what Visual Studio has is this uh, nice display of uh, called parallel stacks which displays the threads. Uh, so we do have two threads. This is the main thread and you can see main and I can double click on it and it shows me where we are in main. What actually happens is inside of main we are calling operator left shift so we are already printing and operator left shift calls uh, a whole bunch of library functions ending up in kernel 32. Um, in, in the meanwhile thread 1, uh, I mean one thread, uh, is inside thread function. And this is where we stopped. And you can see that thread function was called from some startup routines starting with thread start ex. So if I continue, we'll get the printouts, and, and here's what happens. High from main, high from thread. As I said, the fork join is really not that symmetric, so main has the opportunity to, to run first before uh, the worker thread gets its own opportunity. Let us play a little bit with this program. Um, I would like to demonstrate the use of lambdas. Because this is a this is the thread function here is um, tiny, right? Um, I would like to instead of calling the thread function right here, I would like to define this function on the spot. And that's called a lambda. Uh, from lambda calculus and the symbol for for an inline anonymous function a lambda in C++ 11 is the bracket open close bracket treat this as a symbol as like a Greek letter lambda okay and now the definition of a function follows so it starts with the argument list in parentheses well in our case there are no arguments Now, the body of function, I will just take this here and copy it right here. And I will format it appropriately. Because this is the usual formatting that people use with lambdas. So it's, it's good to get used to it. Notice that the, the closing thing, that's, that's this funny combination of symbols that's very characteristic for lambdas, because it closes the brace, the body of the function, and then closes the parentheses because the, the function is passed to some other function, right, and, and the semicolon. So this graph sort of shows you that this is the end of lambda. So that's it. And, and now I can remove this and compile.
Right, let's see. Did I make any mistakes? No. Of course, I can run it. Right, and as before, it prints hi from main, hi from Fred, except that now the function is defined in line. And, and this is an interesting way of looking at parallelism, that you create a block of code that is being executed sort of out of time. And uh, so, so you just say, do this in parallel, this code, do this code in parallel, and then continue while this code is executing, and let's say call high, uh, print high from main, and then join and wait until whatever you spawned uh, finishes. This is very reminiscent of task-based programming. It's a sort of in-between thread-based programming and task-based programming. Okay, now what I want to do is to show you a more interesting example of parallelism. So this is a uh, um, fork and join, except that now we are forking in more directions. We have more branches. The schematic for this is, you know, you start with one thread, you fork into several branches, and then you join them. But this time you are joining um, not one thread, but many threads at the same time. So this, this, um, this is called a barrier usually, or thread barrier, where you actually put a barrier and all the threads ha uh, will stop and join at this point. Now, there is no direct support for barriers in uh, C++11. However, we can simply write one for ourselves. So, first of all, we want to write a, a for loop, right? For int i equals zero, i less than, what should we say? Let's say 10, 10 threads, fine, um, plus plus i. We'll open this, close, do the indent. Okay, so we are starting 10 threads. And then we are going back to main. Okay, but what do we do with these threads? Now we have to wait for these threads to finish, right? So we have to store in some way uh, the results of thread creation, right? So we will we'll have a standard vector of std thread. So we have a vector of thread objects. Let's call it workers. Okay, and now every time we create a thread, we'll push it back on this vector. Workers push back. Okay, push back standard thread. of this lambda, right? And I have to close one more parenthesis. Okay, so um, we have a vector of workers and then uh, we push back new threads onto this vector. And here's the, we are constructing a thread and passing it a lambda. Oops, I don't want to move this. Okay. So now all these thread objects are sitting in the vector. And we have to join all of them. So since there is no barrier, we'll just have to join every single thread in a loop. And I want to do it with for each. Because I don't like using these iterators directly and this is after all C++ 11. Okay, for each is defined in 
include algorithm. Algorithm, correct. Yeah. And for each takes uh, three arguments. The first argument is the uh, beginning uh, iterator. So this will be workers begin. The second argument is the end iterator, workers end. And, you know, the nice thing about this is that I don't have to write anywhere what the type of the iterator is. And finally, I want to pass a function that will be executed on every element in the vector. In, in this case, it will, I will join, right? And I just want to write this function inline because it doesn't do much, right? So I'll use a lambda symbol. Now this lambda takes an argument and this argument is the element of the vector and the element of the vector is std thread and I'll call it, or let's pass it by reference, th. Okay, and now the body of the lambda just th join okay the end of the body and now i have to close the parentheses All right so this parentheses and this okay let's let's look at this program uh, does it look okay it looks okay to me so let's compile yes excellent it worked now let's run this program and you'll see what it produces. Okay, here's the result. So this is an interesting thing that happens. What we are seeing is actually an, an actual interleaving of threads. So while we are in this loop starting threads, some of them have already started. So we have the first high from thread here, high from thread. And this is probably the end of the loop. And then we print high from main. And then the other threads that we just started in this loop, they, they get their chance to print high from thread. Let me run this program again. So here you see uh, after two threads, high from main. Okay, let's try again. This time after one thread, there is high from main. So the result is different. And this is very characteristic of concurrent programs that they are not deterministic. Every time you run them, you might get a different result. And the fact is we don't really like that. We try to write concurrent programs in such a way that they give the same results every time we run. Because dealing with programs that are not deterministic is really hard. Let me do one more thing uh, just for fun. Here we have the printout from every thread that says the same thing, high from thread. So we don't know which thread is printing what. But we have an index here, right? If we could print this index from the thread, we would know which thread is doing what. So let me just, let me just try it. Okay, space. And here we print i like this. Now you can see that um, there is some complaint from the compiler that it does not see i. And that's because the body of lambda doesn't have access to variables that are defined outside of this body. However, there is a way to actually tell the lambda, hey, capture this variable. So if I put i in between these brackets, it means capture variable i and actually capture it by value. So at this moment it will copy it and will store it inside a function object. Because a lambda is really a function object and this function object can have private data and the copy of i will become private data of this object. And this whole thing is called a closure. A closure is a lambda that captures external variables. 
So let me compile this program and run it and we'll see what happens. And this better be interesting. Okay, here it is. Oh, now there is more interleaving. Not only there is interleaving between the uh, printouts, but there is also interleaving inside printouts. That's because the printout is now split into high from thread, and then there's separate call to, to print I, and there's a separate call to print the exclamation mark and new line. So this thread can be just preempted in the middle and some other thread can run. So let's analyze what happened here. High from thread, uh, nothing. High from main. Okay, so we already finished the whole loop and we are in main. Now the other threads are starting. High from thread, nothing. So the number hasn't been printed for these two threads. And then high from thread 2, high from thread 3, and now high from thread 9 suddenly. So they are coming here out of order. And now we have this 1. Okay, this 1 was probably from one of these two that didn't print the number. Because they were preempted in the middle of, of, uh, of the printout. Right? And there is a 0 at the end that was from the first one uh, that was able to print anything. Now, let me try to do this again, just to see that the result is different every single time. Okay, here we have 0, 4, 5, 3, 8, 2, 7, 1, 6, 9, and finally main. Yet another completely different execution. So that shows the non-determinism in concurrent programs very clearly.